Well, um, uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, many thanks to to Albert for for your invitation and and this introduction. Uh, firstly, um, I would like to to give you. Well, I'm going to first uh, moderate and show my presentation. Can can you see my my presentation now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, um, firstly, um, I, I would like to, to give you all um, the, the context of uh, what I'm about to explain. Uh, this presentation is formed by, by two pieces of uh, research. The basic one, which was developed during my PhD studies and uh, related to vehicles exposed to flooding namely their stability and uh, damage assessment. And secondly, uh, a case study of an ongoing European project, uh, its acronym is BINGO, and uh, in which the obtained results ha have been applied. This uh, second research is being uh, conducted at uh, Setaqua, which is a company where I currently work. Okay. Well, I've uh, broken down this uh, presentation in uh, five sections. A brief introduction about uh, urban floods and the, the aim of this research. Section two and uh, three focus on the, on the basic research I referred to before and uh, conducted during my PhD studies. Uh, in section four, the results about uh, vehicles stability and the damage assessment methodology uh, will be or are, are applied in, in a case study, uh, which is framed in the in the project Bingo. And finally, some uh, conclusions uh, will be presented and, and some future research proposed. <clears throat> well, uh, most of you probably know what I'm about to, to explain in this section, but I think it's important to briefly give you the, the context about what kind of urban floods can occur and why they might occur. Well, urban floods may occur due to several reasons, uh, but depending on the type of urban floods um, uh, and the characteristic of, of the terrain, uh, such as slopes and imperviousness, we will have to deal with different levels of velocities and water depths. These hydrodynamic variables are uh, commonly accepted as the variables that define flood hazards. Uh, the consequences uh, are different, so whether a high water depth occurs uh, but, uh, but low velocity or um, low water depths and high velocities. For instance, in the in the second case, uh, pedestrians may may suffer um, slight instabilities, and uh, in the first case, especially when it comes to uh, uh, river in flooding, the flood time of residents is higher, and uh, it is an important uh, variable as well because it can increase uh, damages. Okay. Uh, uh, those are supposed to be videos. Can you, can, can you see the videos? I don't think so. I don't know why those I'm videos... Can you try to share the... open the video link directly? The link? Yeah. I tested it previously and it worked, I promise. Well, anyway, I show the videos uh, later. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, these are just uh, these uh, were supposed to be a couple of uh, examples of different flooding that may occur within an urban area. And uh, on the left, uh, um, we I wanted to to show you a uh, devastating historical urban flood which uh, resulted in nine reported uh, deaths and uh, large economic losses. And uh, well, the capacity of, of the five um, underground water courses that crossed the, the city was exceeded five times, uh, more than 2,000 uh, cubic meters per second. And the hydraulic conditions were high velocities and large water depths. 
even higher than two meters in some places, and uh, it um, in even able to to wash to wash vehicles away, and uh, re more than thousand and hundred reported. On the right, we cannot see, but uh, it. Uh, we can see a, a bit the water uh, running off the, the streets. Uh, um, it's a, a frequent urban flood that occurs uh, because of a lack of sewer capacity when the, the rainfall exceeds the, the drainage network design. Commonly, high velocities and uh, low water depths and lower than the curb height uh, will be produce, produced. And that these conditions are enough to to cause pedestrian instabilities, but maybe not the the dragging the dragging of a of a vehicle. Okay. Well, I uh, here I wanted just to refresh a couple of concepts that we will use in this presentation. The risk uh, is a combination of hazard and the co the vulnerability of the element or person exposed to, to flooding. Uh, it means that there is no risk if uh, either no hazard occurs or it affects a uh, no vulnerable area. On the other hand, um, depth and uh, velocity are the leader to agreed variables to define hazards. And uh, well, you can see here time of exposure, which is uh, quite important as well, but less when it comes to urban floods because its duration is commonly of a few hours. And uh, finally, well, to, to the question who or what is affected, uh, uh, you know that properties and pedestrians have been widely studied, but few studies about how to deal with uh, vehicles can be, can be found. Okay. Well, uh, these are just uh, some examples across the world in different countries. As you see, flooded and dragged vehicles can be spotted everywhere, and probably you have in mind uh, one or more scenes like, like these in your in your own country or or city. These are just some examples. Uh, well, it was <laughs> actually a good uh, video that I'll show you later. Uh, once I met uh, with Professor Ron Cox from the University of New South Wales. In Barcelona, and he showed me this uh, this video. This is an, actually a, an illust illustrative video about a river in overflow, and uh, and it uh, well you, you don't see it, but <laughs> probably you believe me. And uh, it observes how some vehicles are swept away, and uh, it could be observed as well how the water level uh, rises and some vehicles become unstable before others. So in this uh, presentation, we will try to answer this. Why are some vehicles more stable than others? Probably you, you are thinking now of the weight of the, of the car, of the vehicle, but actually this is not the, the only parameter that affects their, their stability. Well, but, but when it comes to flood risk management, not just vehicles instability is important, uh, we have to pay attention to their damages even when they don't lose their stability. Mm, there are different types of uh, instabilities, but usually sliding and floating uh, act together. On the other hand, damages to, to vehicles uh, will be assessed by employing the so-called damage curves, which are uh, similar to those employed to, to assess damages to, to properties. And uh, we will see how, uh, how to define stability thresholds for any real vehicle and uh, how to assess damages to them uh, within a, a case uh, study application. Well, this is just some previous studies. It, just a few institutions have uh, researched the vehicles' stability. Uh, the, the first studies were conducted in Sydney at the University of New South Wales and they still are researching uh, this topic, followed by Cardiff, Tokyo, and Barcelona studies. A recent study uh, was, carrying out, was carried out in uh, Stuttgart by testing a full-scale vehicle and uh, analyzing water leaks when, when the water depth uh, rose. 
uh, at the University of Technology Petrona some studies and um, some studies on this topic have uh, recently started as well. You can see the, the logo here and all these uh, logos of the different uh, institutions. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's focus now uh, on the experimental and numerical study about the vehicle, uh, vehicle's stability. Here uh, you can see the, the hydrodynamic forces acting on a vehicle. The horizontal force is the, the drag force, and, the, and there is as well a vertical force that pushes the vehicle up. This vertical force uh, could be the, the result of either buoyancy force, lift force, or uh, both together, depending on the, on the situation. The resultant FG, the, the capital, the capital one, the, F, the G capital, uh, is called effective weight. And is the difference between the gravitational force, which is due to the vehicle's weight, and the hydrodynamic vertical force. When it is zero, the vertical, the, sorry, the, the vehicle uh, loses contact with the ground. And the, on the other hand, the, the frictional force, which is a function of the effective weight, acts against the hydrodynamic drag force. And uh, well, here the, the frictional force can be divided by the, the, the two axles, as you can see here. Okay. The system is uh, quite simple. Well, 14 uh, scaled vehicles were tested. As you can see an amber written in red on each vehicle, uh, which indicates the, the weight uh, each one should have to accomplish the, the fraud similarity. Uh, as you know, uh, if the phenomenon follows the fraud similarity, the obtained results can be scaled um, can be scaled up to a full uh, real scale vehicle accordingly. Here, uh, you you have the scales, those those scales uh, for each variable, uh, length, uh, the velocity, the discharge here and the uh, forces and forces here according to uh, fraud uh, similarity okay well this is uh, the scheme of the of the model setup we employ to test the stability of the different vehicles and thanks to this um, to this design the slope could be modified and also the the discharge uh, could be modified as well Therefore, uh, several combinations of water depths and velocities could be um, repro um, reproduced near the, the vehicle placement uh, around here, in front of the vehicle. As you see, the, the water depth was here measured through a limiter around 10 centimeters before the vehicle placement, and uh, thus uh, the velocity uh, can easily be calculated. <coughs> Uh, after obtaining the different uh, instability points, uh, a point is a pair of velocity and water depth, these were plotted and uh, a function like this, which is um, a velocity uh, times water depth function, uh, was fitted, as you can see here. All coefficients of determination were higher than 0 0.8 and uh, this horizontal line that crosses the, the curve is a buoyancy depth for each uh, vehicle which was determined experimentally. Uh, well, to do this, uh, the vehicles were placed in a tank and by introducing water slowly, which uh, means without uh, drag force, the buoyancy depth was reached. Uh, well, when, when wheels lost contact with the ground, means that uh, uh, the, the buoyancy depth was reached. Okay, and you can see two very good examples with a coefficient of uh, determination really, really good. Well, after this, a stability coefficient was proposed. This is the SC, the stability coefficient, where ground clearance, uh, the curb wave, and the plan area and a friction coefficient as well uh, are involved. 
a linear relationship was found between the stability coefficient and the constant value of the curve. You can see here the constant value for all the all the models or the, the scale models that were tested and here the calculated stability coefficient. So we have this linear relationship. So the stability coefficient uh, is easily obtained, uh, obtained thanks to the technical documentation of a vehicle. Therefore, its uh, corresponding stability curve can be uh, easily uh, calculated with this expression that you can, you can see here. Okay. Well, however, according to the literature reviewed, uh, the, ex the expected range of uh, friction coefficient values is from 0 0.25 to 0 0.75. Therefore, two stability curves, curves have, uh, have to be proposed, um, thereby defining an uncertainty zone here in gray color um, where the vehicle's stability depends on the terrain where the vehicle is located, the tires, material, and its maintenance, or in other words, the, the friction uh, coefficient uh, value. Okay. Although uh, we can assure its uh, stability for hydrodynamic uh, variables below the lower stability curve the green uh, color that you can see here. This is the safety zone. In this gray zone, we are not sure at all and uh, will be unstable. Uh, the vehicle will be unstable uh, below, uh, upper this, uh, this curve. And uh, the horizontal part of the, of the function uh, is calculated with this, uh, with this expression that you can see here. Okay, uh, which is uh, based on the assumption that the vehicle does not w does not uh, leak water. Therefore, when defining a hazard criterion, the uncertainty zone is one between the two uh, functions uh, could be considered as medium hazard, and below the lower curve, low hazard, and beyond the upper curve, a high hazard. Okay, so well here. Uh, this is just an example about how to proceed with a, a typical Spanish vehicle. After obtaining the two stability coefficients, one uh, for the lower value of the friction coefficient and the other for the upper one, the stability curves um, and the theoretical buoyancy depth uh, can, be obtained, can be obtained. Of course, uh, with this um, with this methodology, the most appropriate vehicle can be chosen can be chosen according to the city or country where the hazard assessment is uh, is being conducted. Okay, this is just an example, a graphical one, where you can introduce the two uh, stability coefficients here. Okay. Well, I wanted to show here here a couple of videos more but they don't work. Anyway, uh, in, in this case, well, on the other hand, uh, to, to complement the, the experimental campaign, um, several 3D simulations were carried out. This is just uh, an example of uh, one of them that were employed to, to validate the, the curves. Okay, uh, a forces analysis was conducted uh, in order to see if uh, for the computer discharge the frictional force is exceeded by the drag force. Okay, you can see both the drag force, with, which is the, the red one, and the frictional force, which is the, uh, the, red, uh, the red one. Okay, so the results were consistent with the experiments, and some other simulations uh, were run. Uh, to validate the, the curves with non-tested hydraulic conditions. Uh, in other words, with higher velocities unable to, to be obtained in the, in the laboratory. And uh, as well aspects such as the validity of the fraud similarity assumption were evaluated by simulating as well uh, real full-scale vehicles. Okay, and here in this graph you can see uh, the red point which is supposed to be unstable and by analyzing the forces, 
you can see here the, that the the frictional force is lower than the uh, the drag force, which indicates the movement of the vehicle. And uh, the opposite here, where the the red one the, is the the frictional force uh, is not exceed is not exceeded by the, the drag force, which is the, the red one. Well, and uh, let's turn now to the proposed damage assessment for for flooded flooded vehicles. Well, uh, as well as for buildings, in, in, in order to assess damages for vehicles, we need first the outcomes from a, a hydrodynamic model. Okay, you can see here the depth map. And uh, the computational grid or mesh is divided in uh, regular or irregular cells, and velocities and water depths are stored in them. These outcomes uh, may be uh, exported as a shapefile in order to manage them uh, through a GIS software. And uh, different inundations can be computed and related to design storm obtained for the desired return periods. As well, we have here the damage curves for vehicles which are needed also. And uh, finally, information about the vehicle pool is uh, required, and this information may be, uh, may be obtained from the corresponding uh, city council. Okay? Well, in this case, the selected cars were those developed by the U.S. Army Corps of uh, Engineers in 2009. After a literature review, it was found that they, they were the most comprehensively elaborated. And, uh, well, the advantage of these curves is that uh, are presented in a relative form, as you can see here, the percentage, which allows us to, to take into account local prices for, for vehicles. And, uh, well, five types of uh, vehicles were considered within this study. You can see here the sedan, the pickup truck, the sports utility vehicles, sports cars, and then the minivan. Okay, and well, just note here that, that when we apply damage curves for vehicles, those are supposed to remain stable. Okay, so in, in case of an instability for a certain water depth, the, the curve uh, begins to be useless. Well, uh, after analyzing the characteristics of the vehicle pool in the study area, a table like this can be performed. This information is required to develop a weighted curve. And, uh, well, a unique, uh, as you can see here, the red one, a unique curve can be employed to, to assess damages because no distinction of the type of vehicle is taken into account with this methodology. Therefore, the characteristics of the vehicle, of the, yeah, the vehicle, the, the vehicle pool, are uh, implicit in this in this curve, which is the, the red one. Okay, and here in this table, you can see all the information that we need to construct this uh, weighted curve. Okay. Well, a detailed study about vehicular occupancy has to be conducted. Uh, in this case, eight windows uh, were studied, as you can see here, eight windows in red color. And those were uh, studied in more depth in order to delineate all observable vehicles in an uh, orthophoto of high resolution. I, th I think you can see here in, uh, in red all these uh, cars that were delineated, but we, of course, are not able to distinguish which kind of vehicle is this? We are able just to know that there is a vehicle here. And, uh, well, in each one, a different percentage. Uh, in these uh, patterns, as you can see here, uh, are the result of extrapolate to a more extensive area the, the, these uh, results for each, uh, uh, for each windows. Okay, so in each one, a different percentage, in each, in each pattern, a different percentage of vehicles occupy the roads, uh, driving and parking areas. 
Well, here, uh, when overlapped the shape file of the computational grid or mesh and the vehicular occupancy, each cell, as you can see here, is related to a certain pattern, thereby establishing a percentage of uh, vehicle area, square meters for each uh, for each cell. So uh, all that uh, we have to do is apply the, the weighted damage curve uh, to each cell, uh, namely to, to the square meters of vehicles contain it within it. Okay, just remember that the damage curve was uh, converted into euro over a square meter. Okay. Uh, so, well, both vehicles uh, stability and damage assessment to, to vehicles have been applied to a case study within the, the European uh, Project Bingo. And let's briefly look over the, the, the Project Bingo. Well, uh, it's uh, Bingo, it's an ongoing four year project, and uh, it is expected to be completed by July 2019. Several partners are involved in, uh, in studying six uh, case studies across Europe. It aims at uh, providing practical knowledge and, and tools to end users, what managers, uh, decision and policy makers uh, affected by, by climate change. As well, uh, droughts and, and floods are addressed. And uh, we are going, and in this presentation, we are going to focus on the Spanish case study in Badalona, uh, which is a municipality uh, next to Barcelona. Okay. Well, the previously presented methodologies uh, have been applied here, and in order to, to assess uh, risks and uh, damages for, for vehicles. Okay. Well, this is uh, the risk assessment, and uh, regarding the, this uh, risk assessment, remem remember that the first step was to conduct a uh, hazard analysis, and uh, this is the proposed hazard criterion based on the, on the methodology uh, to determine the, the vehicle's stability. As you can see here, three hazard levels are taken into account, and the medium hazard here is established in the uncertainty area between the lower, which is this function, and upper stability functions. Okay, so this selected vehicle was the, the Seat uh, Ibiza here, as you can see the picture here, and uh, the most hazardous areas can be uh, observed in the in this uh, in this map. Okay, so these areas are the, the, the most critical areas when it, com when it comes to uh, stability of uh, vehicles. Well, the, the vulnerability analysis was conducted based on the uh, vehicular flow intensity. The higher flow intensity, the more vulnerable is the area. And in this map, uh, you can see three, three levels. Uh, which are uh, observed clearly uh, depending on the vehicular flow intensity. Okay, so well, now we have the uh, hazard analysis and the vulnerability uh, analysis. In the last step, the final risk map is performed by crossing hazard and vulnerability information and uh, based on uh, a proposed uh, risk matrix. Well, depending on the level of hazard and vulnerability for a certain area, a risk level is established. So we can uh, we can see here the three levels, the three colors, and then this area here in the south of this municipality is supposed to be the, the most critical area. Okay. Well, the damage assessment was carried out uh, according to the developed uh, methodology and the expected annual damage was calculated and the damage map performed in order to spot the most uh, potential damage areas, which is as well in this uh, south area, as you can see here. And this is uh, graphically represented the, the, the expected annual damage. Okay. 
Well, and the validation of the of the model was conducted. Uh, was conducted according uh, to claims of previous events. The Spanish uh, reinsurance company Consorcio de Compensación de Seguros offers this information and it has uh, been plotted, as you can see in this graph. Uh, the two most claimed events were in 1999, here, and in uh, 2002. Okay. And you can see here the damage and the number of uh, claims for each uh, event. Well, accordingly, the, the rainfall information of these two events was analyzed, and the, the first event corresponded to a 3.3-year return period, and the second one to, to a 1.7-year uh, return period. Well, and here you can see some images of the flood uh, related to the 1999 event. Okay, and MeteoCAD is uh, where we obtained uh, this information for these uh, two events. Well, uh, here um, a damages uh, versus return period graph was plotted and the potential function as you can see here, was uh, fitted uh, was fitted according to these four uh, points. Okay, this uh, function actually just was required required uh, to interpolate damages, which are here labeled uh, as computed uh, damages. You can see here, and uh, for different uh, return periods, and comparing with real real damages which uh, are actually here uh, labeled as uh, claims, okay? So by comparing these, we can, we can see that our model is, uh, is appropriate because the distance from these points is not uh, too much, okay? Well, the difference, um, there are a lot of uncertainties, as you, as you can imagine in, in this kind of methodologies, but uh, we guess we think that the 47 percent as a maximum is uh, is okay for to validate our model. Well, and just to to finish, um, let me say that as a summary, just uh, to mention that uh, in order to deal with vehicles, uh, a risk and damage assessment may be carried out, and. Uh, the first one requires two steps, a uh, hazard assessment, which is based on stability criterion, you can see here, and a vulnerability assessment uh, based on vehicular flow intensity. Okay, well, regarding the damage assessment, on the other hand, and the two steps are required, a selection of an appropriate damage curves for vehicles, and an accurate, an accurate analysis of the distribution of vehicles uh, within the, the study area. Uh, well, of course, for, for both, a previous hydrodynamic model of outcome, uh, namely depths and velocities for different scenarios is, uh, is required. Just to finish, lastly, I wanted to share with you some uh, research. I think is uh, necessary in order to better understand damages and instabilities of vehicles, uh, as well as uh, improve the, the proposed uh, methodologies. Well, first, so far, only park vehicles uh, have been tested. And uh, we are even using the stability curves when it comes to vehicles in movement. So. We think that considering movement of vehicles in, in 3D simulations uh, will be uh, quite interesting in the future. Well, secondly, experiments with uh, real vehicles uh, would uh, allow us to validate comprehensively the stability curves uh, obtained through testing scale model vehicles. So. Uh, we think this is probably quite expensive, but it would be very, very useful. And, uh, well, local damage uh, curves uh, would increase as well the confidence in the, in the damage assessment, of course, 
and we don't because we don't really know if you use uh, damaged cars are well fitted to our European vehicles. And uh, finally, according to the proposed methodology, only only vehicles uh, parked outdoors uh, can be damaged. But the reality is that a certain percentage of vehicles that uh, we don't know, uh, we don't know yet, are damaged in underground car parks. Well, this fact uh, will be incorporated, we'll try to incorporate uh, to the model to, to make it uh, more realistic. And uh, on my side, and that's all. And now if uh, you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, it's very interesting. So do we have any question from the audience? Uh, Mike, you probably can just use your microphone. Hello. Hello. Mike Gibson here from Center of Water Systems at Exeter. Hello. Yes. I was just wondering if the methodology takes into account the variation of depth and velocities during the, the flooding event. I kind of presume you're using the the maximum outputs. Okay, where in which slide? Uh, so forward a couple. Oh, there. Yeah. Here, so for example. Actually, yeah. Yeah. So you've this got is some the depth and velocity outputs from your hydrodynamic model. Yes, the, uh, this model um, was developed by all the company, uh, well, Aquatec, uh, because they are partners of the of the project as well. And our input for our model was the maximum uh, velocities and the maximum uh, water depths in the whole area. Okay. Maximum. Okay. Of it course, it would be better to to consider different time steps, just to see the, the how the how the the, <coughs> the the hazard and the risk evolve. But uh, we only consider the the maximum for both velocity okay. and water depth. Yeah, I was just wondering if for for the future, if because a, a longer uh, velocity, mm -hmm. a longer high velocity would do more damage. So perhaps you could take that sort of thing into account. Uh, well, the, actually, damage uh, the velocity is <coughs> not a variable that we use for uh, damage assessment. Okay. Uh, we only consider uh, water depth, but I agree with you that uh, velocity is quite important. But as you know, uh, in, in general, in uh, literature, the uh, researchers uh, only use um, water um, functions that depends on water level, just only water level. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think Marion, you also have questions. Okay, this let me read out Marion's questions or comments. She said she supposed the approach could be adapted for cars for insurance, if say, and parked in particular flood zone area or of course depending on the type of car so is there any response for it from you Eduardo about uh, insurances yeah. yes yes the yeah approach. well actually actually the, the the company the reinsurance company is the uh, the com interested in, in actually as well in this uh, research and uh, uh, they provided they provide us all this uh, information about the claims and, and damages of vehicles. And um, one of uh, their one research that that they are really interested is to try to anticipate the uh, the claims and damages uh, before mm -hmm. the claims are uh, claimed actually. <laughs> You know, they wanted to know uh, before they received the, all these claims after an event. They want to know uh, more or less an estimation of the of the damages that they they will be required. You know, because they have to pay all this money. So, for insurance company, 
uh, this is quite interesting and they are collaborating with us a lot okay so yeah if is there any other questions They are thinking about a difficult one. So, Eduardo, do you see Ricardo's question? Okay. Yeah, he's wondering that uh, if you take into account the position of center of mass in your modeling. Well, not actually. This is uh, one thing. Let me show one uh, picture. Mm -hmm. Probably you see a piece of metal in uh, some vehicles, uh, or probably not. I'm not sure if you can distinguish properly the, the piece of metal of some of them. But uh, one thing that we had to do was to adjust adjust the the weight of these uh, vehicles. So what we know is that the engine of the car is in the in the front bar of the of the vehicle so what we did was to in to add this uh, extra weight um, quite close to the front bar of the vehicle trying to uh, take into account this effect of the the center of mass of each vehicle this is uh, regarding the um, the experiments so what we did in the in the in the model was to consider um, a desviation of the center of mass, um, trying to approximate it in, in, to the front part as well. But we are not 100 percent of this effect. Okay, so that's true that it, it could be quite important. But I think not in the in the point of instability, just in, in in the way the car is going to move, because when the center of mass is uh, prob is um, close closer to the to the front part of the vehicle, um, what well, the the way the the vehicle uh, becomes uh, unstable is rounding around this uh, center of, of mass and uh, the the first axle that uh, lost the the contact uh, with the ground is the rear axle yeah. okay that's what happens when we consider the center of mass closer to the front part of the vehicle okay do we have more questions if any you can just use your microphone please Uh, if not, I think we are running out of time. And so thank you again for attending this webinar and thanks Eduardo for your interesting presentation. And if you have any further questions, just please continue our discussion by our different social media. So like in, link, LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. And our next speaker will be Ric Ricardo Martins and he will be talking about his research on next uh, webinar on 8th of November. I will send you the invitation, and so please keep it in your diary. And thank you very much again, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.